So Matty, welcome to the podcast. Hello, how's it going? Good, yeah. So you're an illustrator, you're a photographer, you're an adventurer. Uh, what came first? Uh, BMX came first, which okay. is kind of how it leads into everything. But um, anybody that's skateboarded or in BMX or done any kind of like maybe snowboarding or something, you realise that it's maybe an alternative lifestyle. And so when you grow up on that as a kid, it kind of teaches you about graphic design, being out and about, drawing, doing things off your own back. So I'd say before anything, I'm a BMXer and then everything else follows after that. And that's the case of I do a lot of photography, I do a bit of drawing, I stitch hats, I get out and about, I try and get out on my bike as much as I can, go camping. Yeah, that that was that would be what I would be, I would say. I'm a yeah. BMXer and then everything else is a kind of follow continuation of that. Mm-hmm. And maybe I don't ride BMX like I did when I was a kid, but it's still, that's my heart. And so what got you into BMXing? Uh, well, like everybody, like when they were a kid, I used to skateboard and then you can go way faster on a BMX. So that's why I did that. And then it opened up this amazing world. So like when I went to university and stuff, um, I met some more BMXers there and it's kind of like, any town you go to, there's always going to be a BMXer there mm. and they're at least going to show you around. Maybe they'll put you up or like you've all, almost got like a friendship group without ever meeting them. So you're never more than like one person away. So when I went down there, I went to study illustration and I met a bunch of people that were really into traveling and getting out and about and people have been to America and Australia and stuff. And they'd always taken that traveled with their BMXs and like, like travel to ride BMX and then like, I traveled to ride BMX and then from that I traveled just for traveling sake. So mm. I wouldn't necessarily say I would have gotten to traveling the same way as most people do in terms of a gap year or things like that. I just wanted to go riding with my mates in America and stuff like yeah. see what you see on the TV screen, like be a, pretend I'm Matt Hoffman or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, when did the illustration come into it then? So the illustration came in, I went to York College, I yep. did a foundation and I went to do 3D design. Um, so I wanted to be a product designer and as part of the foundation you have to do graphics and illustration and I really like the idea of graphics but I didn't like the idea of being on computers I like drawing with my hands so then I'd never heard of the word illustration in my life before I went on that course and then within like nine months I'd applied for an illustration course and I'd got in and that was where I was going and I really enjoyed it so what was it that drew you to illustration over the other parts um I suppose graphics it's well, for me, especially at that time, I kind of saw it as you're kind of phrasing letters and you're getting the spacing right and it's very clean and there's like definitive rules. Whereas I like with illustration, you could kind of make it how you wanted and it was quite folksy and whimsical, or the side I saw especially. Mm. And that's like, my tutors were printmakers, so I got into printmaking and I didn't really like the idea of sitting on a computer all day. I wanted to be out and about and I suppose that fits me, who I am. Yeah. Um, but then it's funny because the more I've got into illustration, the more I've used computers, okay. and the more I've gone that way. But like, I think I've found a balance now. So hmm. it's, it's pretty good. Was there anybody in particular you really looked up to in illustration other than um, your tutors when you were getting started? So when I was, when I was at, on foundation, there was a guy called Dan Bug. He's a printmaker in York. Um, and he taught me how to print make and he was awesome. Um, he does like um, printmaking for like Mark Hurd and Emily Sutton and all these really big British folk artists that are also coincidentally from York. Him and another tutor called Jamie, I said, had the biggest impact on me. But then when I went down to uni, just all my friends, like, it seemed like we had a, I was really lucky to go to a really good course where, Mm. where was was it? It was Bournemouth. Okay. Um, So it was a really good collective of people. And I seemed to fit a really good year group where people like to have a lot of fun, but then they also like to work hard and do a lot of drawing. And yeah, like, there was a lot of people on that course that really got me going with it. So what was it like leaving there, obviously going into the real world and thinking, oh, I've got to get a job now? Yeah, well, I'd kind of left and then started saving to go travelling almost okay. straight away. So um, it was, I moved, actually moved back to York straight after. Um, and then I was here for about a year and I kind of saved up money to go away. Um, so it was one of those things where I made a really clear choice when I left uni. Either I was going to really make a go of illustration or I would go and see the world and I picked to go and see the world um, because I felt like if I was going to do illustrations a job, I'd put all my efforts into it. Or if I was going to go traveling, I was going to put all my efforts into it. So there wasn't space for both. Hmm. And although I did some illustration after university and did some commissions and things, it wasn't my primary focus. So I just came back and worked in a shoe shop and saved as much money as I could. I think like before I went, like the last two or three months before I actually flew out, I was working seven days a week, so um, three different jobs. So yeah, it worked out, and but um, it was that kind of 
I had to make a clear decision what I wanted to do and um, I think I made the right decision. So. Mm. so is that when photography came into it when you were travelling or had you taken photos before? Or? Um, I'd always had like a film SLR before um, but I had no idea about any of it. So it was just basic, it was like a Pentax and I could just put it on aperture priority and just twist the lens of it and that's about as much as I knew. So before I went away I made a clear decision to be like... I need to actually figure this out because when I'm away, I'm going to see stuff that I've never seen and probably will never see again in my life. So it'd be nice to actually take a half decent photo of it so I can look back on it and remember it. So I bought a digital SLR and learned that. And now I look back on myself and I had no idea what aperture was or what shutter speed was or anything. And people always say, oh, you need to shoot film because it teaches you how to use a camera. But I found it just really slow and laborious. So mm. um, having a digital camera was sweet. And then I got, yeah. I started going back smaller again. So <laughs> you think you get obsessed with big SLRs and then I went back down to little pocket size cameras because I don't know who said it, but there's that phrase, isn't there? Like the best camera is the camera you have on you at that yeah, moment definitely. in time. So having a little camera you can just sling in your pocket was really, really good for me. So yeah. how, how did you learn photography? Was it just YouTube tutorials? and um, A bit of that and then just snapping away and figuring it out. Trial and error. Um, yeah, complete trial and error. Like I shot manual at first and... It would take me like three or four photos just to get one basic photo. Whereas now, like, I just shoot aperture priority and it's easy peasy. And like, I just try and make my life as easy as possible to get a photo. So the more you do things, practice makes perfect. So. Yeah. But I wouldn't say I'm perfect. But. <laughs> well, they seem to tell a, gl a clear story, which is good. Kind of when I flick through your Tumblr, you know, everything you see and you often write about it. It's, you know, often brings people into what you're doing and that's... That's yeah. often what photography is about, it's telling a story. So I think the more I've got into photography and the more I've used it as a source of like documentation, the more I've kind of figured out what I like taking photos of. And obviously there's an element of what I like is also what I'm doing. So it's just a, a basically a documentation of my daily life. Like going on my big trips and seeing all that has has some really good got some really good photos of it and um it's taught me a lot because when I look back at stuff and then I thought I've captured this amazing photo, you know, there's mountains in the background, like got my tent there and i'm like yes best photo ever get like i get back off the trip like two months later look at my computer and like everything's out of focus and mm. i had no idea at the time like you kind of have to learn because you don't want to make that mistake again necessarily yeah so. do you find you're a person who's more productive when you're around other people or are you more productive when you're on your own so if you go on these kind of trips do you obviously you take photos but do you yeah. get much chance for illustration um I've done some illustration when I've been away and it's kind of one of those things where sometimes when you're on your own, you can do exactly what you want to do. So if you want to prat around with taking photos for like three or four hours, you can do. Whereas sometimes when obviously you're in with a group of people or anything, they might want to go somewhere else. So, But that's quite good because it forces you to take the photos quickly or hmm. whatever. But um, I would say that I can do either. I'm not like, <laughs> I'm, I wouldn't say I find myself more productive on my own or more productive with other people, but... I know that if I want to do something, I'm pretty driven to do it. So whether or not there's people there, I'm, I'm maybe selfish in that respect, but I'll always try and get, like if I've got an idea in my head, I'll be like, all right, let's go and do this. Come on, let's go, mm. let's go. Like, and I, I think probably a few a few of my friends that I've been on trips with could um, testify to that, that yeah. can, it can probably become quite annoying for them. But um, for me, I've got to do it while I'm there, you know. So. Well, you need a certain element of stubbornness to ensure that you, you know, keep making things. Yeah, certainly. Like, like being stubborn is a good thing and also a terrible thing. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, you've you've got to be open to ideas for sure. So, mm. so tell me about Get Wild. How's that developed? Oh well, <laughs> so that started from um, basically I I finished off a canoe trip in Australia and I was going to meet my friend Elliot in New Zealand, and I had to get from Adelaide to Melbourne. And I didn't have enough money for the coach trip. So um, I bought some hats and stitched them. And I was sat with my friend trying to figure out, I was like, I've got to get a name for this because I've got to market it like crazy because I need to get like set amount of money to get mm. this bus within the next week. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up hand stitching a bunch of hats and then mm. I sold them, which got me to New Zealand or got me to the plane to go to New Zealand. And then when I came back, I didn't really have a job. So when I came back to Australia anyway, so it was just pocket money for me. And yeah. then I keep, it keeps sticking over, which is yeah. nice. So Cool. So it's a, an Etsy store and yeah. Yeah, you have Etsy store. social media pages and things people feed into. Yeah, like I kind of, I'm, I wouldn't say I may be organized enough to have like a separate like social media pages for it. Um, so my kind of Instagram is just what I do and then what 
and then put the hats on there as well. And I think people really like that because like the hats and things are inspired by being out and about and mm. going camping, being in the woods or being up on the moors. So I think people really like the fact they can see the photos of where these hats are inspired by and then they can see the hats and then if they want to buy one then great yeah well you, obviously you're the best ambassador for your brand so if people yeah. buy into the brand they buy into you at the same time yeah i suppose so and i think i don't know like i had quite a lot of support in the beginning and people bought quite a few hats off me and maybe the like the the base quality hats weren't maybe the best of quality but people like came to me with crazy ideas for hats and like people have had custom hats and done everything under the sun from to button hats from all sorts so um yeah, thanks to everybody that supported me with it and helped me out. Um, I try and put all the money back into doing fun stuff. So yeah. um, not just paying the bills or whatever, but something else. So. Mm. And you've got an event coming up. Oh, yeah. Um, so that, I suppose that is called the Get Wild Adventure Talk. So that's going to be on the 15th of February um, in York. And that's in the attic, which is a little coffee bar just off King's Square. We've got some fantastic people talking. So um, they're going to talk about their adventures and what, what they're up to. So they really are like... I would say really, for well for me personally, good examples of everyday adventurers. And then I'm going to even talk about my canoe trip in Australia. So um, that should be pretty good. And yeah, there's going to be like really good coffee, really good beer. There's going to be photography up on the walls. There's going to be stuff for sale. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much sold out. If it goes well, would you consider doing more? Yeah, well, I've kind of been asked that already um, because there's so many people that I have just met from out and being out and about that we're thinking about maybe more towards the summer doing a more cycle touring base one this one isn't quite so much so it was really hard not to make it so cycling based i wanted it to be about quite a few things but yeah maybe make one more about adventure cycling kind of later in the year um but we'll see how this one goes first and then mm. go from there so yeah. so what else have you got planned for 2018 um so i've signed up to do it's like a gravel race for mm-hmm bikes which is going to kill me i think um so it's 200 kilometers it's up in northumberland so it's called the dirty in, river in one go yeah it's in one day so um <laughs> which i'm i'm not a, a big like racing cyclist so i've never done like big events and i've probably only once in my life ridden anywhere near that kind of distance and that was on a road and this is all gonna be on like fire roads and gravel but um i've had the lucky opportunity to be invited to do it for free so i'm gonna try and do that and um see if i can actually finish but yeah apart from that just going camping um getting out and about with some friends and um actually off the back of those get wild adventure talks because there's going to be so many people i know that love cycle touring that are going to be in the area i've kind of organized like a bit of a private tour for us all just to go up around the moors and just get some friends together and mm. have a, like show them what i see every day because they're not necessarily from the local area so um Yorkshire's fantastic like, yeah and I want to show them the moors and how there's one place you'd recommend for somebody who's kind of never been up there the one place that I think is quite magical for anybody whether you're on a bike or not is um so out near Hall of Hawkham mm. there's a little um like a remnants of an old little castle up there um that would be worth checking out if nobody's seen it before and it makes a nice walk and you can cycle to it and stuff so um that's really cool it's out near the evening so yeah I'd recommend that but You've got to find your own fun, so everybody yeah. likes different bits, so yeah. So for people who want to see your work and are interested in what you've, what you've been doing, uh, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, so check out my Instagram. That's like like everybody else, I've got one. Um, just find me at Get Wild Matty. Also, in terms of my photography, the Get Wild Adventure shows, obviously there's going to be some photography of mine up on the walls. There's going to be some other people's as well. Um, so that's going to be up there for at least a few weeks after. So there's going to be prints for sale and... Um, if I don't sell them all, I'll put them up on my Etsy page so people can buy them from there if, if they like them. Um, and then in terms of like online, like I've done a few journal pieces for, there's a website called Panya, which is a cycle touring website. So you can check out some photography for, in there. Um, it's also a good website to check out anyway. Um, and then, yeah, I've got my Tumblr, which it's a bit more, I haven't updated it quite so regularly, mm. but um, there's there's a lot from my canoe trip in that, which um, I kind of kept uh, semi like, journalistic kind of diary piece from it um so it's got lots of photos from everything from me making my canoe to being on the actual trip itself and everything between so a bit of my new year's resolution is to keep it updated more so yeah yeah, that's another one cool well thank you for being on the podcast thank you for having me it's been fun um cheers